It may be doubted whether so small a number of men ever employed so short a space of time with greater or more lasting effects upon the history of the world. That's a quote from George Otto Gervalium. He's a historian talking about the Thundercats. Thundercats. No. The Battle of Trenton, A New Hope. Battle of Trenton Two. Electric Boogaloo. Return of the British. Dang it, I get them all wrong. <laughs> you're all wrong, man. You're, all, you're I thought that one was about Maria from the wrong side of the tracks. That Puerto Rican girl. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maria. I just met a girl named exactly. Thank you so much, Leonard Bet Bernstein. Um and <laughs> And the Battle of Princeton, the uh, return of tradition. The Jedi. Jedi. Yeah. No. <laughs> and my goal today, I have a goal today. We're, we're going to be talking. See, you don't get great, important information, and you don't get history like what you're going to get today. You will have likely never heard of this man. But we're going to talk about him. And I'm going to try to convince my main man, Joey, here. That it was because of him that we uh, that 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 this man single handedly in one moment of time in a certain space <laughs> held the entire American enterprise in his hand because of me because of you dude <laughs> I I mean I like I want to thank the Academy <laughs> I want to thank my agent thank God of course for making me better than everyone else. Yeah, man. Take, yeah, have a beverage. Mm. Yeah, have a Thank beverage. you. Yeah. So, who is this? Dude, I, I'm, we're going to talk about one of my great heroes. Um, oh, his shanks. Name. I know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm sabotaging you because this is a th I know nothing. Well, no, you should. You know, you, so I'm sabotaging you. Yeah, I know because you don't want to be convinced that this is the most important man in the entire American enterprise <laughs> history of the universe. <laughs> This is Brigadier General Hugh Mercer. Salud. Oh, man. I just, hearing his name makes me smile. See? I literally heard about this guy, um, I don't know, a couple years ago. And I learned about his story, and it blew me away. And I, and I thought, why, 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 why am I... Almost 50 years. I mean, yeah, almost, we'll say almost 50 years old and just learning about this man today. And so well, I'm 37 and just learning about him. So, so there you go. You never know how old you're going to be when you learn when you something find, new. When you learn something new. But um, I want, hopefully, there's some, you know, younger than 37 folk mm. here that will learn about the great Hugh Mercer and why he is so important, who he is. And, you know, I think that he's one of those guys. He's he's one of those. He's not Washington, so he's not like, um, he's he, he's not a deity like Washington is portrayed so often. Right. You know, he's humorous is a relatable guy. I've heard a phrase used about like in this same context. Yeah. That if Washington, you know, if we take we we set aside Washington, obviously, but Hugh Mercer could be described as I've seen other military leaders who aren't maybe marquee names described, no less serviceable. Yes. Yes. And, um, and he's just a fascinating life and, and really one of the mo more fascinating lives I think of, um, that, that I've heard. I mean, it's just, just incredible life that he li lived, what he did. Um, and we're going to start back. We're going to start back in 1726 when my man, Hugh was born to some uh, Presbyterian preacher in Scotland of all places. What a Presbyterian in Scotland. I know. Never heard of such a thing. And he uh um and we don't know a whole lot, but we can, you know, conjure up some ideas about some, you know, wild and wacky adventures that he went on mm -hmm. in his youth. I'm sure he did. Um but he eventually went to the university. I heard he like got caught wandering around an East German forest. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. There was a story about a kid just a poor mountaineer, barely kept his family fed. Yeah. Then one day, uh -huh. he was shooting at some food, and up through the ground came bubbling crude oil, <laughs> Texas tea, 
And then the first thing you know, yeah. first, first thing, thing, first thing, he's a millionaire. He went back home and his family said, move away from here. <laughs> now, what are you doing around here? They said, you know what? 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 Tell me. Cal tell me. California is the place you ought to be. So you know what he did? He loaded up the truck and he moved to Beverly Hills. Swimming pools, movie stars. <laughs> that wasn't Hugh Mercer's story? That was not Hugh Mercer's story. I know. I, I gave you the wrong book on purpose. I took notes and everything. <laughs> I could see that. Beverly. Yeah, you know. cement pond. <laughs> Said uh, Mr. Drysdale, the banker. Right. I took a lot of notes that now I see have nothing to do with Hugh Mercer. I, well, good thing you have me here. It's always a good I'll be your straight man mm. today. You'll be my cruise director. <laughs> yeah. Um, as we head to, you know, the, the, the grand... By the way, I've got these books about him, and the, the writing in this one is so fun. Um, I just have to read this introduction because it's just... The highlands of Scotland, land of brown heath and shagged wood, land of the mountain and the flood, flood is probably how they pronounce it, um, has always been celebrated in song and story, as stern and wild mountains, its dark, silent glens, its deep lying locks beneath the shadow of the hills. That's how I imagine Scotland. I don't. I don't ever imagine Scotland. That's it. It never comes into my head. Yeah. Okay. Well. I mean, I'm not Scottish. That's true. Are you? No, I'm not. I'm, no. No, I'm you, British. Pure, pure bred. British. I mean, I know Scott. Scott. I'm English. Let's say that. Yeah. Okay. Because Scottish people are technically British, but I'm, I'm just English. Okay. Well. You were on the wrong side of. I mean, yeah. you're kind of on the right side of this. Particular I'm on the world. right side. Yeah, this <laughs> world. You know, that's the thing, though. Honestly, I mean, not to be funny, but when you go back, and it's like one of these things. Like, obviously, my you know big thing is Algernon Sydney and all that. And I'm like, ooh, I wonder which side my if they my family were were royalists or par parliamentarians. Well, both. Right. Obviously, you know, you get to the point where you're like, you have so many ancestors alive at that time, and I'm talking just direct line, and it's like. Every time I would see that, you know, this guy fought against the royalists, I'd be like, Dude. you know? Yeah. But, of course, you're going to have that. So, yeah, I mean, I, to, well, if I could go back in time, I would fight on Hugh's side. Of course. But, you know. yeah. But what war are we talking about, Michael? Well, we're, we're, we're talking about the, the uh, uh, war between the Jacobites and the Hanoverians. We're talking about um, King James the second or the sixth whosever side you might be on at that time um was booted I, I didn't get any credit for that and i'm feeling hurt i'm just moving on okay got you got you i am i'm plowing heard chef plowing heard, heard chef heard heard trying to get all the pecans mm. off the train mm. i mean mm -hmm. tree. <laughs> do you know what you say pecan i say pecan as well because yeah. when i was little my grandma that i've referred many times she, you know, some people say pecan. Right. And so I said, and I called her Nanny, mm -hmm. R.I.P. I said, Nanny, is it pecan or pecan? And she said, son, pecan is the nut. A pecan is what you use at night when it's too cold to go to the outhouse. It's a wise woman. Mm. I think, I think my, my Texas grandmother would have said the same thing. Mm. She, Shout out to all the Texas grandmoms. Imo, love you. Love you. Is um, she still alive? She's not. But she knows I love her. Imo. By the way, she's the one. That makes you cry? That makes me cry. She's no, still the one. She's still the one. Still the one. Oh, boy. Anyway, but she, uh, she's the one that I tell the story about the golf course. Mm. Um, yep, yep. Yeah, she's, the, she's, she's my... You know, insurrector, mm. and she gave me my love for liberty mm. and my hatred for tyranny of all sorts, even if it is golf course marshals. Yep, all of them, always overplaying their hand. Mm. If there's one group of people responsible for our loss of liberty, 
It's golf course marshals. I'm looking at you. True that. Famous old Hannah Hen. <laughs> True that. Um, Aren't all golf course marshals Scottish or Irish? Scottish. Scottish. Yeah, sure Scottish. Scottish. Yeah. And if it's no Scottish, it's crap. <laughs> right? Heed? Heed. No. Move. By the way, by the way, my it's funny. My family, I do have a bit of scat in my family. Mm. Um and uh, and they were actually on on the Hanoverian side, mm-hmm. um, and and in fact, because they did not, uh, he, my you know whatever great times whatever, um, because he did not take the Jacobite pledge was beheaded, and he is called the martyr. He was a reverend, rest in power. Yes, brother Monsignor, grand grandfather Dudley, yeah. love you. You just, you know, it's okay though. It's all right. We, there is forgiveness. And uh, <laughs> if you see Charles the first up there, tell him I said so. <laughs> Did you say, tell me, he said psych? Suck it. Oh, psych it. <laughs> and Charles the second, either yeah, one of them. If either you, one and John them. Locke, while you're at it, because frankly, coward. I'm just going to call a spade a spade. Well, Sorry, I know. I know. We're getting, we're getting all like, uh, hey, okay. The the, no, don't the, the gloves let's are let's off at the day re- on you, Mercer. Let's, Return let's, to tradition let's, podcast. Let's leave John Locke out of this. Yeah, forever. <laughs> <laughs> so Hugh, um, back to Hugh. Uh, he went to medical school at the University of Aberdeen. By the way, I I have to add this. Like, and you know this about me. I think some of the people may not know this about me. I'm a musician by trade training i'm not a storyteller i'm not a historian but i love this man and i love what he's all about i love you too buddy oh, dude. wow gosh that felt weird but in some kind of, ways wrong right. right yeah all the right right and all the wrong is, ways is wrong i don't want to be right <laughs> anyway so um um bonnie prince charlie who was james's son um, was uh, fitting to make a break for the crown. And he gathered up a bunch of Highlanders, a bunch of Catholics, a bunch of, you know, Scottish folk who were kind of sick of the British being down on them. And, 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 and frankly, the, the Brits weren't that nice to the Scots. Um, it just, that's how Brits are kind of They're, bastards in a lot of ways. They are very much. <laughs> so uh, they, um, uh, so, and 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 he, supposedly they had the uh, um, they had the help of the French, so they thought they thought they had some French soldiers that were going to meet them. But when Bro- Bonnie Prince Charlie, the Great Pretender, showed up on um, on shore, yeah, they didn't show. Yeah, they they have a habit of that. <laughs> it tends to happen. Except, I mean, to give them all due credit, right. They they showed up, they showed up to the United States or to America in our war. They did. For they, they did have their they did have their their ships out there ready. Yeah. They, hey hey. I'm all for, dude. Yeah. And, There's uh, no by the way, town without the French. Let's be honest. No, that's true. And I, and, and 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 oh, and a storm. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you ever stop and think about that, man? Like, how do people not believe it? Okay, good. Don't believe in God. Do your thing. I don't care. But seriously, the right. number of times. That's like that. Is it James Furling, the guy who wrote that book, Almost a Miracle? Because he's like, I don't believe in God really as such, you know, whatever. But you go through the history of the War for Independence, you're like, something did all that. Right. You know, the, the, this miracle storm, this change in the weather, the this, the that. I mean, yes, the French, without the French, there's no Yorktown, but there was also that crazy storm. That crazy that storm. Yeah. And there was yeah. that. Yeah. And there's a lot of those instances throughout the War for Independence. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. I feel like I'm not letting you talk enough about Hugh. Why don't you just talk about Hugh? I, I'm, I, talk about I'm Hugh. taking you off course with my, with my it's, yammering. It's okay. It's all right, man. Um, so Hugh, at the age of 19, became a surgeon, which is pretty that, – that's pretty rad, too, if you think about it. Like, you know, there aren't many surgeons right. at 19. And, he, and we don't know why. Um, I suspect – it's probably because um, 
liberty was the word being used by a lot of the the jacobites at the time he took up with the jacobite cause there's some really fun traditions that they would have for example at dinner parties they would um when when it was it was mandatory it was in stone they had to you know god save the king and they would god save the king at the end of the meal and throw their you remember the John Adams miniseries? Yeah. What Sam Adams tell you? Remember that part? I don't remember that part. When they go to whose house is it? Dickin John Dickinson's house? No. Yeah, because he's from Pennsylvania. Sarah his house, and yeah. they have the same thing. It's John, but this is you know pre Declaration of Independence, and so Samuel Adams is there. John Adams is there, and at the end they're all like, "God save the king," and Samuel Adams is like, "God damn the king." That's, I'm like, that's my boy right that, there. Dude, love you, Sam. Dude, I, yeah. It's enough to make you want to drink beer. It, just to say, you know, if his family still it, owned it, I would probably do that. Yeah. Well, he's, man. It's worth, that's a, a nobility that I would support and be like, I don't drink alcohol. And, you unless know, it's just, Sam Adams. Unless it's, Sam, yeah, right. If it's Sam Adams, I'm going to, I'm going to put it away. And then they can't convict you of anything you do wrong that's when you're true. drunk on Sam Adams. It should be the, <laughs> they wouldn't convict me because at that once once that happens, I become the blind Whoa. Rabbi Micah. You, you do not want to see the blind Rabbi well, Micah. And P.S. I'm you know we still have the three strikes you're outlaw. If I get pulled over one more time for DUI, I mean we're talking conjugal visits. Let my wife know. Okay, I will. Because uh, I'm gonna be. Yeah. Well, you don't want to. No, 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 no. I, I don't. I. I I'm just glad I won't be with you during that conjugal visit. Dude, that's weird. Why that's would what you I be said. with me? That's what I said. That's you are the face. blind person. You're already drunk right now. Dude, I'm drunk. No, I just can't. I just can't get another DUI. Okay. Yeah. I will. I'll, I'll, I'll be your designated your ED. And thank you, man. And everybody knows I like the double D. But especially after Sam Adams. Oh, dude. A nice dill and... Da. So anyway, there we were. Da. What's a D word? Uh, dab. Da. No, like a food. Oh, a uh, hot dog. No, a D that starts with D, man. Not hot dog. Dog, comma hot. <laughs> like, what, what do you want? I have a a dog. What, uh, comma hot. <laughs> I'm gonna, next time I go to the ball game. I'm gonna do that. What do you want? A a dog. <laughs> Uh, well, they'll know what I mean, but I'll be right. like, you know, dog comma hot. Dog comma what's a, hot. What's a food that starts with D? Um, dragon fruit. Dragon fruit. That's what I... <laughs> Some dragon fruit dipped in dill. Mm. Oh, that's how it's done. Goes down a treat. That's how it's done. Woo. Anywho, so he, Anywho. sir. So he takes up with the Jacobite cause. He becomes a uh, surgeon in the... Uh, um, the Stuart army um and they actually do pretty well like they do a lot better than what people imagine they were they were kind of like the um Arizona Diamondbacks of last year like nobody expected them to go as far as they did and that was the Jacobite cause you know they were kind of just like you know plowing through they were winning some uh some wars um and then the British got serious <laughs> <laughs> like no, yeah. we can't have you near London. Yeah, I mean, so um, there's um, a very famous battle, the Battle of Culloden, and 1745. So I mean, wait, I have notes on that one. Oh, oh ooh, ooh. what do your notes say? <laughs> <laughs> That's a callback. Those who know know. 16th of April, 1746. 1746. Jacobites crushed. They were crushed, and that uh, it was, yeah, smart. Yep, my 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 good friend. Um, I don't have any good friends anymore. <laughs> uh, they all died. They did die because of that Chern freaking Chernobyl. Tr they were eating too much dragon fruit dill. <laughs> you caught a dill, dude. You got he caught it. He said dill. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think it's pronounced deal. You people in the West pronounce it dill. The rest of us say deal. Oh, deal. We don't actually. I don't it doesn't, it doesn't matter. What's the dill? 
Yeah. Okay. I'm sure. So, um, they were crushed. Chris, crushed. Crizzushed. Oh man, and the butcher of like you when you asked that hot girl out to the prom, and she's like, <laughs> Yeah, that was that was. She's like, Are you asking me out for one of your good looking friends? Like, and you're like, that's the feeling the Jacobites had. That's kind of it, yeah. Because I said, well, I am that good-looking friend, and she's like, oh, well, I'm not going to. They were crushed. I was crushed, mm. and they were crushed, and and mm. they were they were, um, yeah, yeah. The the it was not a good scene. If you were a Jacobite at that time, what would happen is that. This guy, they called him the butcher of, uh, starts with a C. I'm losing my brain. Not the butcher of Culloden. Anyway, he was he was a bad dude, and he would take you down, and he would hunt you down like the Jacobite it's dog like that, that you are. that movie, um, Inglorious Bastards? I like The Bear Jew, remember that? Remember the Bear Jew goes out to, yeah, remember that? How he, like, was I... We're in a Nazi killing business, and brother, business is good. That was kind. Of, that was that was the, the butcher. That was the butcher. That was the butcher. And I don't uh, think that's a nickname you ever want. No. You know what I'm saying? No. Even if it were like, inshallah, one day we get to straight up guillotine a bunch of traitors. I don't want that to be what I remember for. That's right. I mean, I mean, I want it to be remembered that I stood up for liberty, and I, you know was a disciple of he who granted us graciously that liberty but i don't want people to ever say he was the butcher you know what i mean that would be yeah that'd be bad that'd, that'd be, be bad. bad that wouldn't be good and but this guy you know he didn't he didn't have your care for, for mm. you know he yes he was happy to be called the butcher of whatever he was the butcher of but if he you was could def- be called a nickname what would it be like a, a war nickname a war nickname yeah dude iron eagle Iron Eagle. <laughs> Are we just choosing eighties movie name? Red Dawn. <laughs> Red October. Come on, that's pretty, Iron Eagle is pretty tough. Yeah, that's pretty. I want to be Jaguar Paw. Jaguar Paw. That's good. That's good. Maybe. Like I want to my. I want to fight for the Maya. Odd I want to beat the Spanish. I want to be called Odd Gaffaw. That's a good. What does that mean? It means strange, loud laughter. <laughs> Oh, odd guffaw, dude! I thought you were like my name was like Jaguar Paul, so I thought you were like giving some Maya thing that you knew. I was like all impressed for five tenths of a second, and then you're like odd guffaw. It <laughs> seems to be my role here on this. Podcast. No, you take it away, dude. I'm sorry. I just odd guffaw. No, no, it was good. No, you've you've done your damage now. Go ahead and tell your little story. Is it my little story. About Hugh the Merce. Um, he hides. He hides. Which he had to do, right? He had to hide, yeah, because the butcher was after him. It wasn't like, you lost, now go home. No, it was definitely not that. It was lost, you lost, now we're going to make sure you never are able to rise up again. Yeah. that was... It's kind of like the Romans in Carthage. Right. And and if you know that history, what, what, they, what they ended up doing, not only murdering a bunch of families, they, they, they took away their... Um, you know, the things that they love the most, their kilts. The British did that? <gasps> that. Their um pipes. Oh their pipes. Bag they, pipes. Bag pipe, they took those away. They even when they were calling from Glen to Glen. From Glen to Glen. Well, that, I'll take that's, the high road. That's the English road. road. No, it's okay. They're ba- they're 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 bastardly butchers. So was that his nickname? You couldn't you couldn't remember? Oh, no. starts with a C. No, yeah, it was like the butcher of Cromdale. Okay, just run with it. No one's gonna know. They're learning this history from you, mate. Just make it up. That's what I did. Yeah. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. So he left. No, so he stole stole away. He didn't stole away, but he was he was he was um Allowed you not by the British, but he was he was um hidden onto a ship and he came to stowed away. Stowed away. There we go. I think you said that, mate. Oh, you said stowed away first. Stowed away. Trust your instincts. Why don't we stow away? 
a little yacht, a little yacht rock for the people. Um, came to America. Came to America. Came to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, the Quakerville, the Sunshine State. Yes, and um, he uh, started a practice. Started a, um, and I can never get this word right. Oh boy, Academy Ar- Ar- Archimedes Apothecary. Apothecary. <laughs> Dude, are you are, are you American? Did where did are you? I'm a, you're Swedish, but you claim you're not. Right, isn't that the deal? I'm just from California. Uh, apothecary, a drugstore. Yeah, it's a drugstore. Yeah, it's a drugstore. I knew what it was. I just didn't know how Drug, to say it. Drugs, apothecary. Forget about it. It's a drug drugstore. Drugstore. Forget about it. He, I, I mean, I think he was probably a do as opposed to an MD. Is the, the impression that I get, um, but I'm not sure. We don't even. Yeah, we're not really. I know the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, it, I mean, you've done. You've deep googled my man. But I, I did, you know, a couple. I read a couple things. Yeah. I, I didn't deep Google here. We're not talking. This is like page one of Google that I did. Google. I, I didn't, yeah. you know, I, we're not talking sixth page of Google. But I, I read that they said that, you know, as far as his training in medicine, we, re- we don't really know. We don't know. But yeah. we do know he, he signed up as a surgeon. Right, as a surgeon. I mean, yeah, well, he obviously had some sort of training. But right. whether it was like full-blown MD, we don't know. Right, the pickings may have been few for the Jacobite army. You know, you can you can imagine. So yeah, so you'd be grateful for it. Now, honestly, I mean, seriously, yeah, yeah. You know how to, you know. But a man like Hugh Mercer is not going to sign up to be a surgeon, because as a uh, you know as a prank. Right, (laughs) (laughs) right. Um, So he uh, um, started, and and he didn't like Pennsylvania. He he wanted to be kind of more of a you know he didn't like the city life didn't like the mafia that had come into town um probably didn't like the british that were there (laughs) well yeah i mean ultimately right i mean you know and so he so he moved he was he was a country doctor i mean he was a country doctor for years um and life was good and till it wasn't and and we and i think a a good way to think of of uh what happens next is to think it's almost a, con- a continuation of the same war, but just on a different, it's, it's in America. And that is, it's this, this like, um, these, these, the, the, the French, the British, the Spanish, these big kind of superpower European powers that mm. were kind of all in each other's face vying for power and wealth. And, and they had this, this amazing land over here and they were all kind of, gearing up for and um and so we have this thing that us in america we call the french and indian war i know you you know butchers in britain call it the seven years war i'm like you know seven years war okay i got that right um so they and and uh here's the interesting thing hugh mercer signed up he uh he was he became a captain and uh um he, 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 it's interesting because because now he's kind of fighting on the British side, which, like, that oh, happens. But, but it makes a really, I mean, this is something that I liked about the story. I mean, I only knew Hugh Mercer as an American general during the War for Independence. Yeah. Anything that happened before that, I didn't know who he was until you came along. Um, But the thing I like about it, yes, you can say there he was. He literally lost everything he had. Yeah fighting against the British in Scotland. He comes to America fighting for the British. And that would look to anyone like that doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense when you realize that his commitment wasn't to Scotland, or let's say it wasn't anti-British, it was pro-liberty. Right. So if the British happen to be fighting on the right side of that, of that battle— he was on that side. And I also think he felt, I mean, I really do think he felt a great duty to the people that he, he worked with his neighbors. And, oh yeah. And, and these were all British. Um, and they, and they all, they saw themselves as British. Right. Um, and, and, you know, for, for him, it was more that loyalty of, of family, community, um, Liberty, specifically liberty because because if you think about it that's that's the one like strain through all these stories that we're going to tell that he uh um that he was always a staunch defender he was always i mean he was a country doctor but he was a soldier for liberty man yeah yeah that's a good way to look at it that's 
I mean, yeah, he wasn't a soldier who practiced medicine. He was a, a doctor who was forced to be a soldier right. because of situation. Yeah. And and he he gained enough um experience. He was he and and I all the stuff I've read, um, like his men loved him, his the the people um that all of his commanding officers everybody said nothing but good about him he they thought he was smart that he had um he was i think george washington at one point said that he he was always pressing forward he was always on the attack um but he was always looking forward um and and he he did some amazing things which we're going to get into but so he joins up and and and, and fights for the british in the french indian war becomes a captain wait do we i mean just in case, and I, I'm, you know, this is not me derailing it like I have been the whole time. This is actual, like French. I don't know if people know, and I want to make sure they know so the story makes because what all of we what we said might not make sense. We call it the French and Indian War. It was the British and the Americans versus the French and Indians. Right. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't the French and Indian War, meaning the French were fighting the Indians. Because where does that leave us? Right. It was. We call it the French and Indian War, but it was basically England versus France in America. And so Americans were British. So French and Indian War, those two groups were on the same were side. On the side. Right. England versus the French and Indians. And the Americans over here in America, we were British. So we fought for Britain. Right. And it really was a a power struggle that the, the French were trying to get their foot deeper into, um, you know, in, into the Americas. Um, you know, they had Montreal, Mon Mon Quebec. Is that right? Quebec. Quebec. But, uh, um, but they wanted to go further, you know, they, they wanted anyway. So um, he's, he, he goes, and he becomes, I love my, my talking. He goes to what we now call Fort Pitt. Um, well, no, what we now call Pittsburgh. What we now call Pittsburgh. Right. He goes to what we now, where we now call Pittsburgh. And he basically like. But it was called Fort Duquesne. Fort Duquesne. And then Fort Pitt. And then, yeah, Fort yeah. Duquesne, then Fort Pitt. Then the same Pitt. place, and now we call it Pittsburgh. Right. Um, And and he kind of like, again, he, he he's undermanned mm -hmm. um and so he's not able to do all the things i think the, the the british officers want him to do but he is able to maintain a stable fort there he's able to do some skirmishes and and um and at one point um he and uh the general if i well, while you're looking for that, I wanted to tell us before yeah, you yeah. to Fort Duquesne when he was at what, Fort uh, Shirley. Mm, yeah, yeah. And so they had a battle against the Delaware Indians. Uh, he gets wounded in the arm, which my man got wounded a lot. Let's yeah, just, he did. You know, I don't know what it was about him. Maybe chicks like scars. Maybe that was his deal. <laughs> I don't know. But so I'll show you he, mine. <laughs> see my stuff. I've got so many scars, dude. I'm not even kidding. Yeah. It's like a freaking constellation. It's it's like there's Orion's belt and there's <laughs> Cassiopeia. You don't even want to. It's terrible. I was a bit reckless when I was younger. Anywho, uh, so he's at Fort Shirley, and he has the battle against the Delaware Indians. Things go really mm -hmm. south for that. And, he's wounded. and then I, so he escapes miraculously, again, through the Pennsylvania wilderness. Like he... Dwight took him out there. Yeah. And he was going to see, he's like, because camping is really about, you want to do it yourself, see what you're made of. Right. So Dwight drove him out. No, I'm just teasing. That's, that was Michael Scott. We're talking about humor, sir. So, but anyway, has a battle. He escapes miraculously into the Pennsylvania wilderness where he has to go a hundred miles to get back into friendly territory. And he does. Yeah. If I, but see, that's the kind of thing you can't know in advance. Wait. Cause you'd be, I'd be like, how far to British territory? 100 miles. Nah, just, just shoot me, scout me, whatever. Right. Right. Whatever it is you people do, eating monkey brains, whatever you do, do it to me. Cause I'm 100 miles. No. Uh -uh. Well, and, and at one point, he, uh, 
No, wait, I want to read the story. Oh, okay. Because you, you, you might say what I... Let okay. me say something. I know some things too, Mike. Okay, tell you tell the story. Jeez, boys. I can't great, move you. So he survives. He makes it... He makes it out 100 miles to whatever. And they actually, okay, this is the, they write a newspaper story about my man. Mm -hmm. So he met, of course, he comes out and they're like, hey, who are you? <laughs> uh, I know, but it felt so good, man. I had been trying organically to do that the whole time. And I ain't finna lie to you, it felt good. I'm not gonna lie to you. See why I do another odd guffaw. So they interview him, and now this is what. So this is what they write up in the newspaper when he escaped the hundred miles through the Pennsylvania wilderness. He living ten days on two. So it took him ten days to go hundred. That dude was hauling. He's moving. He was hauling for sure. But I mean, they're well, you know. Living 10 days on two dried clams and a rattlesnake and a few berries. And then they tell later in the story, I didn't write it all down, but later in the story they say he actually came upon right. some beef and he's like, no, I prefer the rattlesnake. The, the beef looks pretty gnarly. The beef looks, the beef looks kind of beyond jerky. Right. <laughs> whatever that next step, you know how it's like the next step, whatever that next step in the spectrum of beef dryness is, it was that next band in the spectrum beyond jerky, like shoe leather, maybe. Right. I don't know. But he's like, you know, there was a farmer who offered me some beef, and I'm like, you know what? I got, I still got half a snake. I'm good. I'm, yeah. right. I'm just going to chew on this snake. And these few berries. What's that in your pocket? Dried clams. How far are you going? hundred mile. I don't know. I'm going a hundred mile. <laughs> How do you know until you get? I'm going a hundred mile. Don't ask me. Don't ask me. I'm, I'm Hugh the butcher. Mercy. No, that's a different guy. That's He's a different not the guy. He's oh, not sorry. the butcher. He's not the butcher. He's. But that's a cool story. Dude. First of all, I mean, all of that put together, hundred miles. And what do you? What did you With have? A broken arm. With a broken arm. Right. Right. Uh, Dude, I don't think if I, okay, if, and my wife can attest, if I had a broken arm, I'm a milk it, man. Right. I'm not walking 10 feet, much less a hundred, shoot. Where is, where like, is, mm. my arm hurts. But Hugh goes a hundred miles, gets there, and then they write the story, two dried clams and a rattlesnake. Yeah. It's, it's insane. How far would you go if they said, okay, you've got to walk. What do you get to put in your pack to eat? Two dried. First of all, I don't. Well, and. Dried. What does that mean? Though? It's, it's not It's not like you, he was walking down the street either. I mean, he was like. I think. Enemy territory. Yeah. I mean, he. <laughs> I think a better. Maybe if we got the full newspaper report. Right. Because see, this is the thing, and my, again, my wife, I'm I'm what's known as follow up question guy. Right. I'm always I'm gonna ask that ask as we say in Memphis. I'm gonna ask that next question. If you say to me, I just walked a hundred miles eating two dried clams and a rattlesnake. Guess what? My next question is, where'd you get that rattlesnake? <laughs> right. What? Tell me the story, man. How you got that rattlesnake? Like I, I get yeah. the clam, I clams, dried clams. I don't know the beach. I don't know where you get them. Maryland. I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. But how you got that rattlesnake? That is a good question. Did it, did it bite him in the bad arm and he didn't feel it? And the snake didn't know, so the snake was just like, ah, and he's like, I can't even feel you, snake. And the snake was just digging in, like, come on, Hugh. And Hugh was like, I can't feel it. And pretty soon the snake just tires out. Just and Hugh just bashes it into a tree. I don't know what happened. I don't know how he got the snake. My point is, we need a follow-up question. That is a great question. That is a great follow-up question. I think this is the, also the same part, the same story where he got separated. Um, and You got to keep them separated. You got to keep them separated. And he ended up going to... Um, uh, he, he ended up coming across some some men, some of his men, or, or some some British... Um, and they're, uh, they're, they're, they're talking all of a sudden the Indians are coming. He scrambles into a, a howled out tree and they boogie off. 
right? Okay, don't just... Why do you elide over... He scrambled into a hollowed-out tree. I mean... Dude, that... Is not, if if dude did nothing else in his life, seriously, then hide from the Indians in a hollowed out tree. He's ten times the man I am. I'm telling you, he's just period. Just done. End. End. He's. And by the way, those men were, you know, unfortunately killed by the Indians that who found them. He was not found, and he continued his journey. This is why I said I don't think he was like walking the the I fifteen to, mm. you know, to to the. It wasn't the. I have my notes. Pennsylvania wilderness for those of you scoring at home. It's Pennsylvania, wilderness. which means well, literally, Sylvania means wilderness in oh. in Latin. So he was walking through the Penn wilderness wilderness. You're welcome. Well, well played. Chicks like Latin. <laughs> they do. I mean, it, and broken it, arms mm, and scars and rattlesnakes. Eden rattlesnakes. Oh, that'll God. that'll. Do. Dude, if I had a story, if I had a story where I ate a ra- dude, that's the only story you're ever gonna hear me tell. I, right? That's a that's And I'm gonna make up some stuff. I'm gonna tell you that. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. I'm a I'm gonna make up the hitting the thing against the snake with my ba- against the tree with my bad arm. Right, right, right. Shoot. It ain't gonna be like I came across a dead rattle. Dude, no, come on. No, no one no, ever no. gonna know. It was just you and that rattlesnake, and he can't talk because you ate him. That's right. We know who won. We know who won that battle. Just give us the backstory and make it up. Make it good. Make it good. Make it so good. It was it. Not a song. I don't know. Very many songs. I think I just made up a song, which I do from time to time. Um. So Hugh, known as you, the Hugh, um, who ate the snake that rattled. He uh, uh, makes his way back, and he's he is you know, I, I think he I think he showed up his uh, I, I I always imagine this part too, like let's say the British officer happened to be like at the Battle of Cologne also. Oh, dude! Right? What? Well, cause that did happen in the War for Independence, right? right? There's in the War for Independence. If you read um, what's what's that the name of Middlecoff's book in that series? Um, Oh my gosh. Anyway, Robert Middlecoff, who wrote one of the series about the War for Independence for uh, Oxford Collection, he tells that story about how you had that situation happen in the War for Independence. You'd have American soldiers who just, you know, 10 years prior were fighting with the guys that they're now supposed to kill. Right. Yeah. That I mean, makes that's, that's some weird stuff. I mean, and 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 I mean, I always put in my brain like, you know, if the men left him like not purposefully, but like they weren't exactly sad to see him gone. I I don't know. I'm just saying, like, I'm I can make up a story. Yeah, but I mean, well, that would it would make for you know politics, as the saying is, makes for strange bedfellows. Yeah, you know your 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 loyalties. Are gonna shift if you have if you're a principled person, because so many people are simply partisans, right? Right. I mean, we have the existence of a, a single party ballot, right? You can just pull the Republican lever, right? So we, it, for us, it's hard to imagine someone that could be in that position. But for him, it was just about principle, and whoever fought with him fought with him, and who fought against him fought against him. But it would be. And and also, crazy for the you know yeah and that situation and then I think about like here he here he comes walking in with a rattlesnake skin, <laughs> right? And he's got this story. He's got this broken arm, and he's been gone for ten days. And he shows up at the fort, and and the, the you know the maybe his his head his colonel or whatever is like, dude, like the is like. It's, upset that he because he's kind of showing him up he's like oh i see yeah i see i see where you go with like that. Yeah. The, the the men are like dude you're the man you ate a rattlesnake yeah you hid in the log oh give me some of that and you know the officer the colonel's like huh you know looking him side-eyed well i uh i once say to some marmalade that was out of date what what 
<laughs> I'll tell you, I've got a story to match that one, Hugh. Once, when I was dining with Mamar, her, her servant girl served us a bit of marmalade that had been out of date by two days. I ate it bravely. Poor shame, poor shame. What, what? So, me and you, kind of the same, Hugh? You, you. We're about the same kind of person. I ate Mamar's spoiled marmalade. And you ate a sweet... And you ate a delicious rattlesnake. So I'm kind of more manly than you. Hugh. Exactly. I, I think that's... I'm thinking that's what happened. But he, you know, who knows? You should put that in your thing. The conversation between Hugh and the, the colonel that ate the spoiled marmalade. That would make for... Right for a whole marmalade song. We are Lady Marmalade. <laughs> I think it's going in. Lady Marmalade, but just change it. Spoiled Marmalade. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Yeah. Just I'm not trying. I'm just no, spitballing. No, yeah. I like it. I like it. Just I like, spitballing. I like, where you're, I like where your brain. You're just, you know, I'm just an idea man. So he, uh, um, at, during this time, he meets another junior officer. A guy that um, nobody's ever heard of. A man that I, I know... It's so obscure that when I say his name, you're going to be like, who's that? But he met this fella, this major. I think he was a major. I think he was a lieutenant colonel when they met. I think maybe he was a lieutenant colonel. Oh, that's right. Because I think he was part of Mm -hmm. what. Yes. This, this, this man with wooden teeth. I mean, who would, who, who would follow a guy like that? George Washington. Yes. They met. They became fast friends. Mm-hmm. They did. And um, uh, <laughs> he, uh, um, so much, so much so that, that somehow through this, first of all, they, they promoted Hugh, I'm sure against the Colonel's wishes um, to major that it was, he became major Hugh, I believe mm-hmm. major Hugh. Oh, I have the thing here. Let's see. He was, he was, Promoted to colonel. Promoted mm-hmm. to colonel. So he was, that, and that's when he was in charge of the entire fort, I'm sure. Right, at, at yeah, uh, Fort Pitt. Yeah. Fort Pitt. Until 1760, yeah. And um, and once 1760 hit, he did not go back to Pennsylvania. Mm-mm. He, in fact, went to Fredericksburg, Virginia, and started an apothecary. 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 Drugstore. Drugstore. A Walgreens. Yeah. Started at Walgreens in Fredericksburg, started a, a business, had a had a um brought in some shiny new talent mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that didn't work out. So they started a new one. He started with another partner. Um he uh um <laughs> there's a great oh it's called the Rising Sun. He he spent time at the Rising Sun pub. Mm-hmm. And um, and he met some pretty influential guys there. Yep. He he became doctor to Martha Washington. Wait, no, no, Mrs. Washington. Yeah, George's George's mom. mom. Martha's the I wife. Confused. Mm-hmm. They're both Mrs. Washington. They are both Mrs. Washington, but yeah. Um, so George's mom became as well as Colonel uh, James Madison. Madison, Colonel Madison. Matt James Madison's father was also one of his patients. How kooky would that be? Right. You're like you're in the room with George Washington's mom, and in the waiting room is James Madison's dad. Right. Can you, I mean, how crazy is that? It's like, who's my next patient, Sarah? And you know, I mean, we're pretending his nurse is named Sarah. Right. Who's my next or Hannah? Hannah? Who's my next? Yeah, Hannah. Who's my next patient, Hannah? Um, James Madison Senior. Whatever, come on in. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's see like how- none of those people were. F- I mean, okay, George Washington was famous right. after the French and Indian War. He was a British Army hero, which is weird. They had a parade in London for George Washington. I don't think I knew that. Yeah, they did. They did. They, he was a he was a hero of the British Army. He was. I mean, he would have had his brother not died. I think. I think George Washington would have ended up in England in the British Army regular. Oh, wow. Think about that crazy. Whoa. Like, 
you know, choose your own adventure, how it could have ended kind of thing. Right, alternative universe. G-Dub ends up over fighting for the other side. Who would have been? Who would have been our guy? Who would have been the indispensable man? Like, seriously, that is true. Like Hugh Mercer? Mercer. No, I'm not. No, I think you're right. I think you would have been. Uh, I'm going to throw something at you. All right. Benedict Arnold. Oh, dude. Benedict Arnold. He was the real deal. Until he, he was the him. real deal Holyfield until he decided to, to mm-hmm. you know, take the money and run. Yeah. But you had, you know, you anyway. There was Hugh, Mercer, Hugh Mercer. He could have been. He, he could have been the man. He, was, he definitely had the skills. and He, he could have been the first. Pro- Think about how weird that would be. Dude, that would have been have a Scott as the first president. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I mean, just saying, you know, so George Washington was famous, get no mistake, but George Washington's mom mm-hmm. was not fa- would no. no, no one would have known who she was. I mean, in her town. Right. You know, that kind of thing, because town, you know, we used to be close with our neighbors, but it's not like it's just it's not like today. If you were if your patients were Barack Obama and Bill Clinton's parents, people would know, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, we don't know who Barack Obama's dad is, but, you know, assuming that we did, we know who his mama is. I mean, his mom. Yeah. But anyway, but the point is, it'd be different today. But back then, can you just imagine if you get to, like, just bibbity bobbity time travel, right. and you're standing there in Hugh, Hugh, Hugh Mercer's, uh, you know, drugstore, and he's over there treating George Washington's mom, and there's James Madison's dad? Mm-hmm. How crazy! It'd be crazy, and 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 the other people that are there. John Paul Jones is there. He becomes friends with John Paul Jones. He becomes friends with, um, uh, 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 um, John Jay. Oh my gosh, not John Jay. He be, he becomes friends with the the um. Now I'm losing my brain. This is why you don't have a musician do a. Uh, no, I mean it doesn't matter. <laughs> famous people, famous people yeah. that you know that you've heard of, uh, Mason, George Mason, George Mason. Oh yeah, that's he was pretty, friends with George pretty Mason. Pretty big name. Yeah, pretty big name. You yeah. know, um, and you know, and in Virginia, I mean, come on, how many people are there? Um, we know that. Uh, uh, I'm sure he knew. Um, Give me liberty, Patrick Henry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure he knew. I mean, all those guys. They were, and he was very. Uh, I mean, he was a doctor. He he was a wealthy doctor, and 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 I mean, I, I call him a country doctor because he was. He was a country doctor by training. He was, um, um, you know. But I mean, he definitely he he was a a shrewd businessman too. He had he owned several lots in town. Um, he was able to. Um, you know, gain a lot of influence. Um, and, and, and he met a young lady, Isabella Gore, uh, Gordon, mm-hmm. and they married and started having children, started having family. Aww. I know Aww, those two kids, Hugh, oh, Isabella, I knew they were going to get together. Tree. I knew they were going to get together. Yeah, it was, it was, it was fate. I mean, yeah, they broke up a few times. You know, I, I could tell those two kids were going to. We're gonna make it work. <laughs> We're gonna make it happen. I, uh, you know, I, I just had a feeling, you know, that that Huabella, that was their ship name, Huabella. I knew there was hope for Huabella, because I'm like, man, I'm gonna tell you the truth, because I don't front. I spit the truth. I know you do. Huabella, if they hadn't have made it, ain't no hope for none of us. No, that's true. Ain't no hope for nobody. They were, yeah. Huabella. Huabella. They were. Huabella. It was the benefer of their. No. Of the 17, of 1775, mm. 17, probably 1762 or something. 17, well, I don't know when they got married, but he opened his apothecary in 1771. Okay. And that was before the apothecary. So, you know. Yeah. So. 1770, probably around there. Yeah, that time. Um, his brother in law owned that pub, the Rising Sun. Oh, wow. And. Um, there's some, and I always, and I do always, I do think about that. Like, you know, when we think about, um, you know, a pub or, or something, um, at that time, I mean, it really was the community center, you know, it was where the men would come and, 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 and communicate, see what's going on, talk politics, talk, you know, how's the farm, you know, that was, that was where that would happen. And, um, 
I mean, I'd love to be a fly on that wall to hear some of those conversations with, you know, oh, for sure. Um, all those, all those, if guys. you could understand him, that's true. He probably had a great, oh, he had a brogue, <laughs> brogue. he had a rough, you get, I guarantee he was rough as a cob. That dude's brogue, man. <laughs> that, maybe that's why sometimes his men quit. You know, he had a, Could be. he had a history of his men being like, my enlistment's up, I'm out. Maybe they were just like, Dude, I would, I would stay longer, but another day of listening to you with that accent, I'm going to stab myself in the ear. I hey. can't with that. In, dude, speak English. <laughs> so, um, and very successful, doing well. Doing well. Having kids. Doubly well. And uh, then, you know... Um, the the you know the the British just as I mentioned before they're kind of bastards. They can we just say they f a'd and they f o'd. They they did they did, and this was in the f a portion of that this is statement. <laughs> We're still in the f a portion of the show, right? Um, they don't f o for a few years. No, no, but there, but but things are getting a little bit heated. We're talking 1774, 75, and um, you know, but but in Virginia, my understanding it was a, a little bit more peaceful than um, up north with you know Sam, our boy Sam. Yeah, you had a lot more. You know, that's a, a historical thing that people don't talk about much in the South, in Virginia, especially. You had a, a lot of. Cavaliers, mm -hmm. you know, a lot more gentlemanly strain of uh, immigrant, and so you have, yeah, a bit more, a bit more loyal to the crown, which you found down south a bit more loyal to the crown, the as the Cavaliers were, and um, so you had a, a harder time down south. Uh, I get the the Americans, we had a harder time because the British found a lot of. Uh, friendlies because beginning at the very beginning a lot of those who came to the south were gentry that is to say they were second and third sons of of wealthy families right. or at least Bill. merchant families yeah. and so they were they were loyalists they were you know they supported the crown and so yeah um he and the other thing to think about it is is they really did see themselves, and, and we don't talk about this enough. They saw themselves as separate countries, separate states. Virginia wasn't just a state in this United States of America. It was its own government, its own uh, place, had its own history, had its own people. Um, and and for, As it does now. As it does now. As it does we now. We just deny it now. Right. But it... it but it... But it yeah. Yeah. It, it, for example, just the other day we saw the we saw the Baltimore Bridge fall, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know about you. I felt a little bit like, dang, that's a bummer. Where if that happened in I don't know, Canada, I might have cheered. No, uh, but if if it happened in another country, I wouldn't have thought as much of that. I thought, oh, that's a bummer. But it was right. It would have been. We don't have that. Um, they did not have as much fealty to this uh, satanic cult that we call washington dc they had no fealty to any central right. government right i mean they did there was because there was a, the, the first continental congress was well as we've discussed congress it's a collection of ambassadors from different countries and so they had no sense of in fact i mean abraham or abraham like, <laughs> benjamin franklin said benjamin franklin's like okay so when they were debating the Articles of Confederation, mm -hmm. which is around this time, right? Benjamin Franklin said, well, here's the, you know, because there were some states that were kind of holding out. And Benjamin Franklin's like, look, this is only supposed to last while we're fighting a common enemy. What, if we lose, it doesn't matter. If we win, once the enemy is defeated, then everybody goes back to their respective homes and we're not united anymore right right his whole join or die that he literally drew that that wasn't of a, a union of a political sort that was joined together against our common enemy but i mean there are literal letters in from the you know first congress where it's like 
well, don't worry about it. And then the second Congress, don't worry about it. This isn't the creation of any sort of central government. Right. We're First of all, we call it Congress, which gives away the fact that we consider ourselves a, you know, a gathering of ambassadors from distinct countries, like that word means. And he's like, second of all, when we defeat our common enemy, well, we're not bound by anything right. anymore. Right. That's, you know, we're just bound by our, a common enemy and that's all, right. you know, yeah. Which, which makes, uh, when I, putting that in perspective, when you hear, um, for example, Patrick Henry's famous speech, which is around this, right at this time, you know, of, of give me liberty or give me death, you know, it, it took a lot of, um, I don't know what the right word is. Like you had to think, you had to think like, oh, wait, there is an enemy at our doorstep, even though they may not be, um, you know, the, the a lot of the problems are happening up north. Um, like you had, to, you, I think, I think they had to have some foresight to see um, that that this was going to be a problem for them too. Because it, it would be as it would be as if um, somebody attacked, you know, Mexico City, and like, are we going to? Should we go fight Mexico City? I mean, I don't know. I, you know, so I, I think as these people were thinking about like whether they should that's, fight the British. Um, well, that's a big mistake they made though, Mike, the British. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's such a, I mean, I wish you could just take people to make them pause and just think through things they've been taught and just dissect, just deconstruct this in your head. The mistake the British made that ended up resulting in a thing like Patrick Henry in Virginia saying, you know, this stuff's going on in Boston, mm -hmm. everything. The mistake the British government made was treating the 13 colonies as one. Because to them, Canada and the 13 colonies, those were our, that was British North America. Right. And to them, that was just, those were our children. They're going to do what we say. That was, if they had taken those 13 colonies and treated them as we did living here, as 13 independent little republics, we would still have the queen on our money because it would have been, there would have been no common enemy. Right. But the problem was they just wanted to get as much, you know, it's like one of the British uh, ministers once said during the war, he's like, the real secret is we need to get the honey without disturbing the bees. And the problem is, they disturb the bees. And so that caused this war because they could have very easily said, all right, we're going to have a, a policy for Virginia, which would have been lenient mm -hmm. because filled with loyalists. We're going to be lenient. Then you have a policy for Massachusetts. We're going to lock down a little bit harder. But they didn't do that. I mean, yes, they ended that, you know, the Boston Port Act was only Boston. But to them... When they would make decrees about why they do like that, Stamp Act, that was throughout the. All that the was time. everybody, but they didn't say the the when they would excuse the things they did. The British, when they would explain it, first of all, they'd be paternalistic, which would anger people. Right. Don't don't tell me what to do. Don't say you're my parent and I'm your child because we both know that ain't how that went down. And the second thing they would say is, you know, as our colony and as we are your Majesty. We have the right, and, you know, Parliament literally said, we have the right to legislate in any case whatsoever. Right. That is, you belong to us. And the colonists were like, that's not how that started. But also, okay, now you're saying you're grouping all of us together. Right. And that caused South Carolina and Massachusetts to be united where they would never have been otherwise. That's a great point. I appreciate that because that that really um, helps understand like when Patrick Henry, because there there was a lot of consternation. There was a lot of questioning um, at that convention, um, the Virginia convention, where they were talking about whether they should, you know, go to go to arms and and uh, it it would if it wasn't for Patrick Henry giving a stirring speech and saying no. The, they're on the, they're, our, our brothers are out in the field already. We are at war already. 
give me liberty or give me death, like it would have been a different story. Once again, that speech being printed three days later in a Boston newspaper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but for, I mean, you talk about that great leap forward. Yeah. I mean, but for, again, Johannes Gutenberg, nobody knows who, there's no war for independence. Right. Because you don't have, I mean, Cato's letters, we don't have Cato's letters firing people up in the 1700s. They're printed in a London newspaper. How are you going to find out 3,000 miles? You're not. Except for the fact the printing press the exists. Print. We're going to print it up. We're going to bring 1,000 of them to Boston and just hand them out at the, at the, right. at the port. And so Patrick Henry, that, he gave that speech. A couple of days later, people in Boston are like, all right, we got some help down south. Let's do this. Let's go. And, and they did. And, and so and this is where Hugh comes back into our story. Um, because of his uh, because of his, his experience both um, in Scotland and mostly in the French Indian War, um, he was up um, to be head of the First Virginia um, Regiment, and uh, they and uh, they had a vote to decide who would decide, and and he lost by one to Patrick Henry, and. Uh, um, and and the word is he lost because he was a Scotsman, which I, you know honestly kind of makes sense. I mean, the ac- I mean, no one knew what he was running for. The accent. <laughs> if, they, if, they, if only he spoke what English. Is he, is he running? Is he? What's he running for? <laughs> I can't, under, dude. I can understand. Like, I, I don't think he's. I'm, I don't think he's speaking English. Patrick Henry. Just put, we got it. <laughs> how do you even spell Hugh? <laughs> There's a lot of silent stuff in that. Let's uh, Patrick. I know how to spell Patrick. Mercy. How do yeah? Can you imagine they were just like, yeah, that's a good idea, and then they're good. They get their little silent ballot, and they're like, oh, let me get a. Uh, it's like, so who are the candidates again? Hugh Mercer and Patrick Henry. No, Patrick, I got that two two good English names, Patrick. Patrick. But you know you're a two first name guy, right, Pat? Oh, you're a two first name Jones. I'm gonna call you. I'm gonna call you double first name Jones. <laughs> And in is the foreigner, foreigner, right? <laughs> so then it was just like, all right, uh, everybody in favor of uh, two first name Jones, raise your hand. Three, how many for foreigner? Two, two, two first names. You're up, you're up. Let's do it. Strap them on. <laughs> and uh, there, uh, by the way, there is a great um quote. I gotta read this. This is. Um, because later on, um, he he ends up being the the leader, the colonel of the third regiment of, of Virginia, and um, and and eventually is is promoted even further, which we'll get to. But he, uh, um, <laughs> one of his men was actually promoted to major later in the war, and uh, he, I, I just got to read this. This is so great. Um, Blah, 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 blah. When he overheard General Mercer express his disapproval, so at this point he was a brigadier gen- general. General Mer- Mercer expressed his disapproval at the promotion of Captain William Washington of the Third of Virginia Regiment to the rank of major of a troop of cavalry, and the other officers confessed their surprise at Mercer's position, especially given that Captain Washington had received a promotion for gallantry. And this is what Hugh Mercer said. And this, I think, um. When I read this, I saw I, I I thought, man, this is this is one of our guys. This is this is one of this is one of us, or who I hope to be. Let me say it that way. We are not engaged in a war of ambition. If it had been so, I would have never been accepted. A com- I, I would have never have accepted a commission under a man who had not seen a day's service. Alluding to the great orator and distinguished patriot Patrick Henry. We serve not for ourselves, but for our country, and every man should be content to fill the place in which he can be most useful. Dude, that guy has priorities right. Yeah, I mean, the humility, because he's right. Patrick Henry wasn't a soldier. Patrick Henry was a lawyer. Right. But situations made him a soldier. But he was a soldier with no experience, and Hugh Mercer had already fought in two wars, mm-hmm. and you know it, it would have t- it would not have been um, 
humility is the right word. He, 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 many, many, oh man, would have seen that as a, um, as a slight, shall we say? Yeah, I mean, it, absolutely. His humility. I mean, if you you take and you aggregate his humility to his uh, his courage, mm-hmm. and then double down with his commitment to principle, and you've got a guy that is uh, every ingredient right. in the recipe for hero. Absolutely, yeah. he. Uh, you know, I think he. Um, absolutely, recipe for hero. That, that's that's him um so he becomes the head of the third regiment and um and is called to uh to fight up north with washington and uh and he be, he soon becomes uh promoted to brigadier general um washington trusted him trusted uh his not just his loyalty but his um his uh ability to to lead oh there's a great story by the way with the third regiment i wanted to tell um where there's a there's some there's, there's a some, little story you'd like to tell about a three young brothers you know so well no so well that's it started way back in history i know the rest of this but i don't go on tell, i mean i do know it tell hugh's story hugh's story i'm focused so hugh um nice right eye roll <laughs> I meant nothing by it. <laughs> all right, all right, brother Will. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, but but there were some men that were kind of uh, not on the program, shall we say? He, they were um, uh, very much, um, you know, they're causing trouble um, and were leaderless. And Hugh Mercer put an end to that. Um, Let's see if I can find that quote. I thought I had it marked. Um, yeah, he put he put an end to it. He, he they they called him in and said, "Here we need to we need to uh, you know put this uh, put these people down." He took away the weapons, threw a few in jail, um, uh, and then made them I guess made them prisoners, and then and then basically said, "Guys, you know we are here for our liberty. We we are here not." to um uh we're, we're not here just for our own ambition as he said earlier we're, we're here for our your wives your children um like stand up and fly straight brothers and they did they turned it around um and and they absolutely became um, part of that regiment and, and became loyal to Hugh. Um, as I mentioned, he, he was promoted to Brigadier General, went up to fight with General Washington, and um, here here comes uh, some craziness as far as um, we're getting to the end of 1776. Um, well, the weird thing that I noticed when I did my little bit of study yeah. was so when Washington briefs Mercer on his mission, it yeah, yeah. he he briefed Mercer July third, seventeen seventy six, which of course to them meant nothing. Right. Well, they back then July second was the day we declared our independence because that's the day it was voted on. But they wouldn't have. But he, they wouldn't have known that in the field. I mean, maybe right. the next day, maybe by July third, maybe they knew. But I, I doubt they would have known at that moment. But the point is, you think about the weird, you know, confluences like that, right? You say we've got Congress who's doing their whole thing and declaring independence, but you've got Washington. He's out there, literally declaring independence means nothing. Like, it's yeah. not worth the paper it's printed on if we don't win this war. Right. And so, but you've got to think about the whole situation of did that, would that have made General Washington happy? Yeah, I mean, yes, because either way, by this point, 
it's it's you know the end of a noose it's the end of a rope for right. them if they don't win right and so i mean even if they win but he gets captured right i mean the whole the british are coming that's what that was all about right was you know uh they were trying to capture samuel adams and and uh anyway but the point being that and then john hancock but there they are july 3rd 1776 and it would i don't know i can see them being like yay we got to put this off we got to celebrate you know because like i say back then july 2nd was the day because that's the day we voted on it to declare our independence and they would have been like yay let's celebrate but wash is like let's save the celebration till we win till we win right Right. let's not pop the champagne <laughs> until the last whistle blows right Especially as, as we've been go i mean they started with twenty thousand men and now they're you know things weren't going it, it they weren't not, going good. Not good they weren't going well for the good guys that's no. for sure no it was not it was they were in much need of a bank and shot little, what's that <laughs> they were oh, in much they, need of a bank shot yeah, they were in need of something, and and it's like, but just to think them standing there and, yeah, let's all give the men the day off because we declared independence, and right, <laughs> that's gonna do us no good when right, we're right, that's yeah, when we're dangling off the end of that British rope, I don't think any of y'all gonna be like, but we declared independence, right, and and uh, I like declaring bankruptcy, it kind of <laughs> because you if you declare bankruptcy like if you just declare it it's it doesn't really matter you have to actually I declare bankruptcy it's like that's what they did they just stood I up and they stood up in you know I philadelphia declare, i declare independence, independence. <laughs> like, right. what? what did you you have to do something more than that right what do you have to do you have to write it down oh that's cool mm -hmm. tj well, you wrote it down now they gotta win something now they're out in the field general washington is telling look here I got a job for you. <laughs> and he did. With his flying Dutchman. His flying yeah, that dude, that whole story was in it's like it's like the Delta Force. Right. It's so when I read that story, I mean I knew that there were types of the, you know, those types of story throughout the, but that you Hugh Mercer was given command of what they called the flying camp yeah the flying camp dude first of all that's a cool flying camp is a cool name way better than iron eagle it is better it's not as good as jaguar paw but it's cool <laughs> flying camp and he's like so your deal is to keep keep new jersey from being overrun right we want to protect new jersey you're in charge and he's like so where are my men he's like oh yeah no we're gonna have like your regular like you know, he's like, have you heard of the Delta Force? He's like, no. no. He's no. like, well, someday there'll be this, because George Washington was a time traveler, in case you didn't know. But anyway, he gave, yeah, the flying camp. So they're like, this is this bunch of guys that, you know, we're, we're maybe not going to have the uniform on when we do right. the stuff we do. Right. You yeah. know, maybe, you know, maybe we, maybe we, you know, now and then. have the to, down low. Yeah, we have to bend the law sometimes, you know, and. He it makes me wonder, like George. I mean, they were friends in the French Indian War, so I would like to be to think that, like, if you let's say you're George Washington, yeah, and that Which you knew you had to protect something and you needed somebody who was unquestionably committed to the cause, virtuous, experienced, but also had no trouble, you know, right? He maybe. You know, new, new, new where the lines were in the shadows of the law, you know, right. the penumbras of the law. And it, I would like to think that I'd be a kind of person you'd be like, yeah, that dude, I, I want him to do that. Joey, you're my flying, you, a flying camp camp. No, I I do think that that I mean, it's it's wild. And and yeah, that was that was his job. He was to go out to go out, protect New Jersey and also get information but if, when you we can, can when i have my i don't, I don't oh, by the way he only had like 400 men like it was yeah yeah like, yeah well, that's what i'm saying it wasn't yeah. like here's your whole battalion <laughs> it was like you see that guy over there picking his teeth with the bowie knife he's one he's one <laughs> you see that guy cleaning his gun resting it under his chin he's another one and it's a real crack squad right <laughs> But I'll say, can I tell you something? You know how, like, I, I always tell people, find out how your family, what role your family played in history. What, 
what went on? Make it personal, man. So the battle of so the crossing of the Delaware. Yeah. Well, the New Jersey side of that. Yeah. Was my family's land. No way. Yeah. No way. Truth. Charles Wolverton, look it up. That's a... yeah. So isn't that crazy? I mean, it means nothing to me. No, but that's pretty rad. Though, Other dude. than that's my what I think it's my tenth great grandfather. That's cool, man. That's very cool. Yeah, I mean, but fine. Everybody, it's not exclusive. Obviously, everybody's. You're probably past. all related to Joe, so it's your land too. Yeah. This land is my land. This land is your land. This land was made for you and me. <laughs> But the point being, everybody has the story. The, the, I mean, literally, don't let history be be antiseptic and inert. History is the is just a written down record record of the behavior of human beings. Find out what the humans whose blood flow in your veins. What were they doing at the time? What were they doing? Uh, do they have journals somewhere? Go to the house if it's still if you're in the East Coast, like my like the house that uh, Charles lived in is still there and it's a bed and breakfast today. Wow! And it's still called the Wolverton Inn. No way! Yeah, that's so. Hip. But my point, well, but my point is, there's just as likely to be a Levitt Tavern, right. you know, and that kind of thing. So it means so much more to you, and you find out so much more about yourself if you can do the. A little bit of investigative work to find out what, how your family intersected with history, because it makes it more, it makes it more alive to think. That's crazy that George Washington got out of a boat, and my grandpa or whatever, you know, was like, "What's up, G Dubs?" Yeah, right? Oh, that's pretty sick. Yeah. So I mean, just but find out for yourself. Do that. Find Absolutely. Out, maybe you're. Maybe you're kin to Hugh Mercer. That'd be pretty dope. Dude, that would be fantastic. Yeah, that'd be very I cool. mean, yeah. Anyway. So. It, 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 he, he left quite a legacy. Um, he, uh, um, so, yeah, so now we're coming to uh, the Delaware. And things are not good at all. It is bitter cold. Do you know what Delaware? Delaware. In New Jersey. <laughs> to the Delaware. Do you know what Tennessee? What? The same thing, Arkansas. <laughs> I should be ashamed, but I'm not. Oh boy. Thanks, Dad. Um <laughs> <laughs> Ah, wow. Yeah, I think he's he's <laughs> Go ahead. That's all right. I'm just making a musical out of this darn thing. <laughs> we got to have a. We all got to have a hobby, I guess. I guess. So he. Uh, um. So yeah, we come up to, you know, Delaware time, and uh, it's not good. It is. Uh, they <laughs> they need to win in the worst way. Yeah, they are. They are rough, no, They're stacking L's hard. They really are. By the way, it's it's, it's interesting. I um learned about general lee and how he, he was um i guess up north a bit and and washington was trying to get him to come down he was like making the call hey come down come down and he was refusing and he was in the middle of writing a letter to washington uh complaining when the british showed up and took him away so mm -hmm. serves you right lee um but it did um I think it was General Lee. <laughs> if I didn't get it right, yeah, look, totally, it up. Totally look, look it up. It's only a history podcast. <laughs> Why bother about the facts? <laughs> Don't let it get away with a good story. No, or, no, or joke. joke for that. Or joke. Oh, I think that was a personal shot, sir. Yeah. Well, knock, knock. Who's there? General Lee. General Lee, who? Generally, I don't go knocking on strangers' doors. I'm sorry, you. Action. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Delaware River. Right. So we need a W. We need a dub. We need a dub. And um, and interesting enough, because they stole General Lee, they took him captive. Mm -hmm. Um, the other general was who was loyal to Washington was bringing their his troops 
down. And uh, they, but they, they needed a win, and it was getting to be cold. And they knew that once that river froze, it was skidatza. It was over. It was, yeah, they were doomed. They would see those nooses probably before the beginning of the year. No, I mean, they probably would have been, yeah. <laughs> before New, New Year's yeah. would have been a special celebration for the British if they hadn't got across that river. Right. So um, they met. They had a war council. And, you know, as we all know, uh, they, they decided to cross on Christmas Day, uh, Christmas night. And there's a lot of people that actually think that Hugh Mercer was not just involved in the planning of that, but came up with the idea that it was mm -hmm. his, his action, his, um, his idea, his idea, the, 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 yeah, as Washington said, he was always looking forward, never looking to retreat. Um, and so they made that decision to go cross and man, they, they, they crossed where we find again, uh, Battle of Trenton won a new hope and um, they take on the Hessians. The Hessians are don't know what's coming. And um, by the way, this is another like we talk about the turns of history and the weather, mm -hmm. like because it was so bitter cold and to imagine and, and the as as they talked about in their journals later, um, they couldn't see in front of their face. However, that actually ended up being to their advantage mm -hmm. because, because the Germans couldn't see in front of their faces they either. See and so when they came up, it was eight o'clock in the morning when they should have been up and ready, round and go. But again, but another, you know, uh, not, not a miracle in that. I mean, it is a miracle in that case in the yeah. sense that no one could be seen, but also they did, you know, doing it the day, that they knew that the Germans would more than likely be hung over. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you, 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 you take what you find and if you're, you're coming up and you've got across this river and you don't take the day off cause it's Christmas. Right. But of course that wasn't a thing no. in the 1770s. It wasn't like, let's take two weeks off for Christmas. <laughs> right. Christmas literally lasts one day, dude. What are you talking about? But it was unusual for battles to happen. Yeah, it, it was unusual. And, it was an, and, and um, Howe had sent his men basically into winter quarters or was working his way into it. 100%. 100%. And, um, you know, that was, the, I mean, there was just that window of opportunity that Washington and his men took advantage of. Right. But that's, you say, we say those phrases, and I know that we all say them, took advantage of. That's, you know, those three words, there is a lot of courage, a lot of discipline, yeah. a lot of commitment, a lot of, you know, characteristics that we don't have. We would, we, fortunately, our independence was won before the excuse factories were built. Because for us, there'd be, a, oh my goodness, can you imagine asking, you know, one of us to do that? First of all, it's Dude, it's Christmas Day. I want to be with my family. Right. It's freezing out there. There's way more of them than there are of us. And I got like, the shoes. We can, yeah, we can totally wait a couple of days. Let's just camp out here, wait a couple of days. Right? All of these things. It's so dark, I can't see my hand in front of my face. Right. The excuse factories would have been, you know, you know how it is. They're open 24 hours a day nowadays. But in 1776, it was like, well, we have to do this. Right, and, and so I think, you don't. The excuses don't exist. And this goes back to um, what you've talked about, what we have talked about on this podcast. That there, there, for any great liberty endeavor, there has to be a people prepared to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Like we don't vote our liberty back; we have to go and take it back. Yeah. And these people were willing to do what it took, and and I'm sure you know. Uh, I know it took some cajoling. I know it would, I'm sure the men were not thrilled to do a, you know, five mile hike. No, but whatever. isn't that the definition of courage? It is exactly the definition. Acting in right. spite of your fear. Yep. Yeah. Right. It doesn't mean you don't say, are you? Wow. Okay. But it doesn't look, you know, all of that. You're allowed to voice that. But when the rubber hits the road, you 
follow the you follow the command, you do the thing. Right. And and they did. And this is um one of the things that I didn't realize is um so so they 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 took Trenton, they beat they beat the Hessians, and they're sitting there and Washington is still realizing all the, the of the upper command is realizing these men are leaving in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. This is not good. And 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 um I thought um I I am always imagined it like they won, they were happy, woohoo, let's go get liberty. But that was not what happened. What happened was they won, they were happy, and they were ready to go home. Well, it's someone else's turn. Right. They were they were ready. Well, there's to- not a it wasn't a professional army. No. It's yeah, it's for liberty. I'd done my time. Now the Somebody guy else. who yeah, you swapping off, right? You stayed at the farm while I did my year. Now it's your turn. Well, right. I have to go to the farm and you do your year. It's not a it's not a matter of I'm out. I did mean I'm out. It wasn't right, right. bad. No, it, was, no. it was it was yeah, I believe in the cause, but But I gotta feed my family. I, I gotta exactly. I mean, why you know, George Washington didn't return home for eight years. Right. And George Washington died penniless. And by the way, the cause was so bad before that crossing that Washington uh, tried to uh, make arrangements for people to ski daddle from Mount Vernon. Um, you know, how, how are they going to get everybody away? Um, I mean, it was not, not good, but it was still not good. Because even though they won, as you said, it was somebody else's turn. And Washington first tried to bribe him. You know, he said, here's 10 bucks for everybody. Here's $10. And by the way, $10 is like a million dollars today's money. <laughs> so, I mean, just saying, like, it's not the same. I don't know if a million. Maybe a little hyper. Maybe the math ain't nothing on that. Because <laughs> I, I think I, I only count to four. I only spelled a G, man. I got you. <laughs> but they, uh, um, but that didn't work. In fact, it's. A- but wait, if you only spell to G, how do you spell three? It just counts. Gotcha. One, two, my ink tips. Anyway. <laughs> so- You're giving me the ick tips right now. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, so they. So, but th- I mean, one of the takeaways, I mean, yeah, yeah. it needs to be emphasized. The crossing of the Delaware, it is. More likely than not that that was Hugh Mercer's idea. Yes. That's a huge... That, dude. And we never hear that and, part of the story. But that's because of that's who he is, yeah. man. Yeah. He doesn't want the credit. Yeah. He's not... He said it at dude's... By, by the way, did you pay, pay attention to the last name of the dude that was getting promoted? Yeah. Yeah. Washington. You know, maybe if, you know, Uncle G-Dub is in charge... <laughs> You Always getting the credit. It's like, hmm, how did you get? But the point is, he's like, we're not here for your ambition. Right. We don't know this. None of us know all these stories about Hugh Mercer because Hugh Mercer didn't care if you knew or not. Right. He cared. I have to do what is right. If I do that, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's enough of a reward for me. Yep. Absolutely. Um. So we'll never, no one's ever taught that. You know, the crossing of the Delaware, you know, Hugh Mercer. Right. Yeah. It's it and and he's man. I it's one of those things I feel fortunate, um, in a lot of ways. One of the ways I feel fortunate is that when I when I came across the name and the basic story of this man that I looked just a little bit deeper and found out that he was in fact the real deal. He was the genuine classical definition of a hero. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So a man of wisdom and virtue that loved his fellow man enough to sacrifice for the good of all, you know, and not to do so for personal credit or personal acclaim or anything like that. Otherwise, We'd have, you know, when's the last time a biography of Hugh Mercer was written? At least, I don't know, 100 years? Oh, well, I think there was one like in the 40s, yeah, right? Yeah, which is this one right here. Yeah. 
So, I mean, that how many? There's probably been ten books about George Washington in 2023. Right. I'm not saying Hugh Mercer is the same or on an equal footing with George Washington, but I'm saying, do you ever wonder if we don't get taught about these heroes on purpose? Oh, I. Th- that's what I thought. I thought because why no have one I not heard this. No one thinks George Washington. If you're you know, George Washington is a name that's become almost impotent to us because we just have images in our head, mm-hmm. right? And his his courage, his valor, all that. Like you said, you didn't know he was a hero in the British Army. Right. Yeah. But none of us are ever going to be taught that because I think that our lack of education, our lack of inspiration— because our school isn't in designed to inspire, so we're not we don't get taught about Hugh Mercer. Because if it was, mm-hmm. if it were designed to inspire, this podcast would be the most boring thing ever. Because everybody would be like, "You left this part out of the story. You left right. That. No one's going to do that because no one knows the story." Right. And 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 we all have heroes that we can relate to, and it's so important that we learn about these people um, that are just are they're just they're right here. They're, 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 uh, anyway, it's, it's, uh, because if you can get that inspiration, if you can get that inspired, maybe, just maybe, I'm talking to myself right now, maybe, just maybe, when the time is right and I need to act like Hugh Mercer, I'll know how to act because I read what he did. And maybe, just maybe, Hugh Mercer is your 10th great grandpa. I mean, seriously. Yeah, possible. You know, you look into it and you're like, I want to, and then you find out, oh, you know, but, the yeah. point is, there are plenty of people in from that era worthy of the designation hero, and we don't get taught about it because we're we're just supposed to keep certain stock images in our head because that prevents us mm-hmm. from wanting to be heroic ourselves. And and those who who they want to make heroes are people like Alexander Hamilton. Oh. Right? <laughs> That's yeah. Anyway. Um okay. Rest so, in peace, Aaron Burr. Amen. He shot his shot. Um so um by the way, it was at this time that I, that where I, I mentioned that quote where about um the promotion. Um and I want to read one more thing from this this era, from this these days. General Mercer admitted that Captain Washington, the person that was promoted to major, was a good infantry commander, but he insisted that that did not mean Washington was destined to be a good cavalry officer. I have seen good captains make indifferent majors, announced Mercer, and he ended with a bold declaration. Again, this is January, uh, Jan- January 1, New Year's Day, 1777. My views in this contest are confined to a single object. That is the success of the cause. And God can witness how cheerfully I would lay down my life to secure it. And he wasn't American. He wasn't American. Nope. It was the principles of liberty. But did he try to get a law passed in Scotland to have them increase the taxes in Scotland to send to America to help us be free. He did not. But he believed in the cause, so what did he do? He came and fought for the cause. There you go. If you're so he, you know, you're so gung-ho to set the Ukraine free from Russia, get on, get yourself over to Ukraine, get a gun, knock yourself out, Holmes. Fight the Russians all day, every day. Good luck finding them. Wink, if you know what I mean. Good luck finding a battle over there. But let's pretend that it's really happening. You go over there, knock yourself. If you believe in it, dude, go. Right. Go today. S- Show that you really believe. Set up Show a charity. You believe in it. Don't steal my money and call yourself charitable. Right. Yep. Get your candy butt over there. And show that you believe in Ukrainian freedom. It's just, I mean, right? Absolutely. No, ab- absolutely. Be, you know, these examples, it does, it's, it nothing deep. has changed. Just, nothing has changed, right. man. If you wanted to, Hugh Mercer didn't like 
you know, try to get a law passed to help support the cause of American independence from England. Right. No one hated the English more than that dude. Nope. Right. Right. But he's like, he did not. He thought, I support the cause of liberty. I'm going to get on a boat and go support liberty, and I'll probably get killed. Mm -hmm. But then that makes him a hero. But today, if you support giving money to Ukrainian oligarchs, then you're a hero. Right. You've done something heroic. Right? No, rubbish. You've done nothing. <laughs> you've weaponized your vote because you're too much of a wuss to steal my money, so you make the government do it for you. Don't worry. Notes are being kept. Angels above you are silent notes taking of every action. So do what is right. And I'll be reading those books. So we, um, we come to the Battle of Trenton 2. Electric Boogaloo. Boogaloo. Big the, the British strike back. Um, the Empire strikes back, literally. Right. <laughs> A New Hope, and then now we're on Empire we're on Strikes Empire. Back. Yeah, I got a theme here. Um, and uh, um, oh, and, this, oh man. And and what's 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 cool is uh, Washington sends like a small group up um, to just slow because because at this point, um, Howe and his men. How is the British commander? Yes, brother? thank you. Where the British commander Howe is heard the fighting in Trenton and is and is trying to bring his men down to support, um, and they uh, uh, what happens is uh, 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 I lost my train of thought. How did I do that? I don't know, but I'm gonna go and. The British ambush them. And the British ambush them, but they but they don't. They, uh, my understanding is Washington sent a, a a small group up to slow them down, to keep them from coming, and, and or to keep them from coming as quickly as they did, as they could, so that so that the Americans could get across um, the river and into safety before uh, the the British retake Trenton. Right. The problem is British scouts see mm. the British scouts were at a pub. Right. That and they went by the they went by the pub and they're like, who are the that's and right. so they go back and say, Hey, guess what? And then they double time. Right. Yeah. So so Washington ski across across the river and um and there they are for the night. And uh How's uh, General Howe's upper management? <laughs> his his uh, um, his officers are imploring Howe to go across the river and finish the job. Like they have him, and the the rebellion is over. Yeah, you got him where you want him. It's 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 done. And uh, Howe decides to let them sleep. Let the let the British sleep for the night. Yeah. And uh, Washington has another war council, and decides. You know what? We're probably smart to mosey on out of here, and um, they uh, end up taking a a road less traveled um, by a. Did it make any difference? It in, it in fact did make a difference. Did it make all the difference? All the difference in the world. Mm. So they take this road to Princeton because what had happened is. How had left a small group up in Princeton, and Washington could take his men, take Princeton, and now he's got how surrounded. He's got this like whole. Oh, and there's also a um, uh, a bunch of uh, artillery or, or weapons available to him up further north from Princeton that he wants to get a hold of. There's a Bass Pro Shop in Princeton. There is. <laughs> They have to t take a federal ID check to get to No, it was before. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, good thing. Good thing. Yeah. Um, the British would not have accepted any <laughs> any sales. Of no. Anyway, so they uh um so so they sneak around. If you know, they sneak around this road, heading up to Princeton. 
Um, and Washington leaves behind several men to put up fires so that the British uh, think that they're still there in camp. And, uh, and, he, and, you know, the old fox, General Washington, once again out foxes how and they, they sneak up and around now here's here's the issue they're going well, to do it does he see this thing does he outfox him no the thing is the british by this time have had a professional standing army for about a hundred years okay right since our last episode about you know the levelers mm -hmm. right so they've had a standing army for 123 24 years by this time right so it wasn't a matter of being out fox. They had regulations. They were trained. They were taught. There's things you don't like the whole thing about we're going to march in a line and face off against you because right. why? That's the gentlemanly way to go to war. This, w there were literal manuals written, right? You don't hide behind trees. That's cowardly. You don't hide behind, you know, stone walls. That's cowardly. You stand in a line. You let your enemy stand in a line, you know, you fire, then the people behind you step up. And so how it wasn't even that he was out fucked. He was just doing, he was just a British being British. Right. He was, this is what we do. This is how we fight battles. Right. And so, I mean, there's a great advantage to the fact that our guys were just farmers. We're, you know, I'm not a soldier. I haven't been taught the right way to kill someone in a battle right the right way is whatever way i'm able to do it so i get to go back home to the farm that's right yeah right? so that my wife doesn't sleep a widow tonight exactly that's that's how yeah. we, that's how we get it done but how and all of those guys their deal was nope you do not break protocol you do not you never violate the mm -hmm. code of military conduct even if it to your detriment if it yes if you end up suffering because of that guess what you suffered in you suffered but it was the, it was a no a noble so yeah it was an honorable <laughs> it was an honorable defeat right. at least you didn't not only get defeated militarily but morally as well right whereas the americans they're they're not playing by the correct rules no they're not and and they also, um, uh, by the way, I want to just back up a little bit because I, I started to talk about um, that they were struggling to keep the men there. Yeah. Um, and it, it's actually quite remarkable. Um, Washington first, you know, offered him money to stay. For one, million one million dollars. One million. One million dollars. And then, and the drum sound and nobody steps forward not one person and then they start playing jump around by house of pain and they, oh yeah it was over then they all signed up jump around jump around they then um but but then washington turned back and he um frankly talked to them as men like he's like mm. this is for your freedom this is for your liberty i understand i can't ask any more of of you than what you've already given but i'm going to ask you to stay for one more month for this cause and i know it will be worth it i mean that's basically was his message to the men and one by one almost all of them re-upped for another month which again shows the courage that's why he is the indispensable man that is why and lots of people were better generals yeah yeah, he was able to... Including Hugh Mercer. Including Hugh Mercer, which, by the way, this next attack was... Kind of, oh, this this was also in his tent. It probably his idea to get out, you know, out from under. I, it, there, there are there um, are people that, that make that claim. That Hugh Mercer was the tactical um, brains of, of this, of these 10 days that changed history. Um, so... Um, so they, they head up to Princeton and, uh, General Washington gives General Mercer his, and his 400 flying camp. Um, he kind of pushes them up ahead. Um, 
I wouldn't say a scout. It's more as like a first. Uh, maybe it was more like to soften the beach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was kind of his job. Um, and at as they're heading north, um, the the men in Princeton, the the British in Princeton, begin to head south uh, to reinforce the uh, Howe's army in Trenton. Well, that would have worked out great, except for they saw each other. <laughs> Yep. They saw each other, and uh, um, hey, hey, wait, 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 hey, you're wearing the wrong coat. You ain't no red. Anyway, um, Hugh and his men uh, are heading for a bridge um, to try to secure a bridge, um, and the British come, and they see him, and they attack, and. Another important thing is that the that the Americans at this time, the reason why why Washington wanted to get up to uh, that armament is they were they they had lost a lot of rifles. Uh, I think there was one bayonet for every five men. Um, it was it basically if it if both sides were because you know both sides had limited had had ammunition right. shortages. Right, the British had plenty of weapons, but a gun without a bullet's a club. Right. Unless you stick a knife on the end. Right. And then it becomes... And then you've taken a club to a knife fight. Yes, you have. Right? Yes. And that's what happened. That's essentially what happened many times to the Americans was we, you know, once we run out of of bullets, so to speak, ammunition, well, that's done because the British have bayonets. Right. And so you've got to retreat or it's going to be a crimson pulpy stain. Right. So, um, so the, the, the British take aim and they fire three volleys into Mercer's men. Um, and, um, and, and they retreat, (laughs) they retreat quickly. (laughs) Um, and this is the moment where I'm going to make my case, brother Joey, that the entire American enterprise held in the balance because, um, if they retreat and those British get on the backside of Washington, it it's could be curtains. It could be a bad, bad, uh, a bad problem for the Americans. Um, so at, he was trying to rally the troops. He's trying to tell, he's yelling, stand, stand your ground. He gets, hold until relieved. That's right. He gets his, he gets his horse shot out from under him. Jeez, I know the poor guy can't catch a break. Cannot catch a break. By the way, I've thought about this. This is another area where, I, well, let me let me finish the story first. He stands up and he's and he's telling the men to hold their ground, hold their ground. He's on foot now, and he turns and there are seven to eight uh, redcoats coming towards him. And they mistake him as Washington. Hey, we've got him. We've got Washington. <laughs> they, they, they. I get dibs on his teeth. By the way, and this is this is my point. I because British people have bad teeth. They all have bad teeth. <laughs> I got dibs on his teeth. Oh, they're made of wood. Oh, never mind then. <laughs> I think this is another. I'm going to call it a miraculous moment, in the sense that if they if they thought it was if they thought that was Hugh Mercer. I think that bought Washington more time. Or if they thought Hugh Mercer was Washington, yes, that, that, that bought Washington. Washington hears the shots. He immediately comes. He, he starts to make his way, but he's still far away. Right. And uh, But the British are now all focused on Hugh Mercer. Mm-hmm. And they, they start yelling at him, get the traitor, get the traitor. Because they think they've got George Washington. If they got, I mean, you want to be that dude. Yeah. If you're a British soldier yeah, and you, you want to be the dude that, brings the head of washington For you want to be sure. i mean you would like it'd be like a foot like in the super bowl you score a touchdown no no the equipment guy's not getting this ball right <laughs> no, no 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 this is going in daddy's case at home that's right you're not putting this in the in the chest with the rest of the stuff you know so you want to be the guy you want to roll up to you know george the third and be like, like look what, what i got, I got. <laughs> yeah. except the teeth i took the teeth <laughs> And George III's like, that's not George Washington, what, what? 
that's that's Hugh Mercer. And he's like, <laughs> but then whose teeth do I have? <laughs> Hugh Mercer's idiot. Like, come on, man. But how did they? Why were they so loose? I don't know. Because uh, you punched him in the face with the butt of your rifle. Right. You have and to do all the thinking just because I'm king. But God chose you, the shimmery lady from the lake, bestowed upon you absolute sovereign power and declared you to be king of all the Britons. Who are the Britons? We're all Britons. Oh, all right then. But who names you king? Who voted for you? No one votes for king. Oh, I didn't vote for you. No one votes for king. Oh, how'd you become king then? Keep going, Monty. No, I stopped. But that's good. That's good stuff. It, it is good. It's good. All right, go ahead. So they think they got. So they think they got. They, they think they got the main man, and they're yelling, "Get the traitor! Get the traitor!" And Hugh Mercer stands up in his glory and says, "I am no traitor." Pulls out his sword. That's all he's got. And starts fighting off the British single-handedly, giving Washington more time to come down and and uh, buoy up, which Washington does. Washington Washington comes down. He re revives his men, and um, Hugh Mercer, in the meantime, has taken butts to the head and big butts to the head and seven uh, bayonet strikes, bayonet, bayonet strike to his torso and he's and is left for dead this is and this is where when i was reading this I'm like <laughs> left for dead right uh, they, they figure out well, that's not george washington dang it I think that's and they're just like out. we got to find him because we already we already told someone we killed george washington <laughs> well if we can find him before way, i can totally see the like because by the way this is the this is the famous story that we've heard of of George Washington rallying the troops, uh, riding his horse in between the British right. and American army. The British are taking shots at him and cannot hit him. They've got they've got point blank range and they cannot hit him. And the only reason, Master Joey, the only reason that Washington even had a chance to have that miracle happen is he had one man stand up in between his men and gave him time to rally the troops and bring him home. And that man was Brigadier General Hugh Mercer. Or you can, you know, that is an awesome story. But tell the, tell the, you know, Paul Harvey this business. Give okay. Us so he's late. left for dead. He's left for dead. There he is. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> he's left for dead. Mm, I've got a thing to do. His men come upon him. And find him, and guess what? Whoa, 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 how many, yeah. They, they cut, yes, they come upon, yeah, you're right. They, they come, come upon, upon him, but even that, you're like, came upon him? Right. They find him laying there. Yeah, and he's just like dead, essentially. essentially. I mean, he seemed, he looks dead. He looks dead, but they, but they revive him enough to, to say, hey, we need to get you to this house to get taken care of. And he's like, I must see my men victorious on the field. And so, yeah. It's so brilliant. <laughs> he's so good. He's got a he's got a good line. He he, he delivers good lines. He does, even if you can't understand them. Right. <laughs> At the time they're like you you bleed the hen in spurious. What? Right. Oh, I see my man. What? I come on, man. Speak English. So he uh so Maybe that's why he's not more known. Because we just can't understand what he's saying. What are you saying? We had to wait for the we had we had to wait for the the English translation. English translation to come out three hundred years later. Scottish later. to English translation. <laughs> I can't do a Scottish accent. If I could, I, I would, but I can't. I can't do any accent, so I will. <laughs> everything will sound blah, mumbled. Um. Anyway, so they 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 hear his request enough to set him up against an, a broad oak, <laughs> a broad oak tree. I mean, I mean seriously. Can you imagine? Like, there's no such thing on a ma as a man on planet Earth today. <laughs> you got rattlesnake hiding in an empty tree, right? Oh my! Yeah, just like taking bullets, doing the whole thing, going on his like his uh, what a hundred miles through the wilderness. 
this you know shot out for horse shot out from under him right i mean holding off so washington taking bayonets to the body butts of the gun to the head and, and he's like i must see my men victorious and then they're like no bud you're hurt let's take you to the hospital let's let's get you no back. heed no heed set me up. He's like, find a broad oak <laughs> where can i find a broad oak what you need a bread a the red coat no a broad oak bread soaked i don't a broad oak you idiot a broad oak but i mean think about that there's literally not a human no, he... male on this planet that qualifies for the designation man if and... hugh mercer is the standard we use to measure it amen that is a fact. Put me against a tree so I can watch my men win as I bleed out. Right? By the way, he does he he does live for a bit. Nine days? What do you mean a bit? My man lived nine days. It gets better. It gets better because the immortal. So which doctor do we all hear about? Seuss. Yeah. Dr. Seuss? Dr. Seuss was dude dr rush was there benjamin the, rush benjamin rush was there and he's the one that's taking care of hugh mercer now hugh mercer has some medical knowledge right he is a, do a doctor he is a doctor and hugh mercer is saying don't worry about my wounds it's my head that's the problem yeah he's like i'll be i'll coagulate i'll be fine with all of this i'm pretty confident with the bleeding but there's some serious, there's some cranial issues we need to address. No, no, no. I said I'm fine. Right. Nope, nope. And Rush, we're only gonna, we just want to put a bandaid on what, what. Nope, no, I'm good. Let that go ahead and wash out. <laughs> Closed system will be fine. Let it wash here, out. Here, here. I'm pointing to I, the problem. It's my head. <laughs> my head. Head. No. And, and by the way, and 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 the, the another part of the story during this time, I, I, I um. What is it? uh Washington's nephew? I think. Anyway, one of one of the men is like the LeBron James of the Americans, where they're crying foul because they they think they think like the 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 uh, Hugh Mercer was done wrong and that he should have been given quarters. Oh yeah, well explain. Come on, explain what that means. Okay, Give it, so like, should we throw quarters at him? He deserved to have some money thrown. Essentially, you're like. I give. I, I I'm a yes. Officer. It was in the it was in the code of military conduct right. that if someone of a certain rank and a senior officer, which Mercer was as a general, a senior officer, if he asks for you, you know for quarter, meaning time out, mm -hmm. you give him time out. That's the rule. It sounds stupid to us because it's stupid, right? But that's what the British the manual. They'd had 120 years of the manual. If a senior officer of the enemy asks for time out and you take it, you don't kill him, you escort him, you give him aid, you give him food, you give him comfortable lodgings. Now way, he's a prisoner, don't get me wrong, but he gets to be treated in a in a in a way merited by his status. Which which makes sense, especially I mean, if, if you think about it from like a royalist point of view, because likely that person asking for quarters might be your cousin. Yeah, in the in the British army, that's little Lord Fauntleroy's, you know, son. And if you don't get if you don't treat him right, when you get back home, you know, your blacksmith shop is gonna, you know, be shut down. So yeah, it makes sense. But he's and he's like, he's, yeah, he could have you know, and the guy is saying, the guy's saying well, the, he's saying the British did him wrong. The British did him wrong by st st stabbing him a lot. <laughs> and but uh, so okay, we're gonna up his manhood <laughs> even even up further because this was this was what he said. What Mercer said what when Mercer he said. hears that the guy says, "The British did you wrong, man." He said, you, "You're a general. You should have got safe passage to somewhere." Right. He declares. The tale which you have heard, George, is untrue. My death is owing to myself. I was on foot, endeavoring to rally my men who had given way before the superior discipline of the enemy when I was brought to the ground by a blow from a musket. 
At the same moment, the enemy discovered my rank, exulted in, in their having taken the rebel general, as they termed me, and bid me ask for quarters. I felt that I deserved not so opprobrious an epithet and determined to die. As I had lived an honored soldier in a just and righteous cause, and without begging for my life or making reply, I lunged with my sword at the nearest man. They then bayoneted me and left me. So the British did what the men... Uh, well, hold on. I don't know, page what? What page is it with the, if we've got a general with a lot of wounds? 432. 432. 432. Section B. You shall, oh, hold on. You shall ask the ruffian general, a rebel, sorry, I'm not a good reader. Rebel general, if he'd like a dime. No, it's a quarter. quarter. A quarter. <laughs> if he'd like quarter, ask, hello, um, general. Yeah, all right then. Would you like a di a quarter? Could we give you, would you like uh, just a little bit, a quarter? I've got some change. Yeah, all right then. And so Hugh Mercer, so the British did what British people do, which is be British, which, you know, there's a lot of words you could substitute for British, but we're not allowed to say them because we'll get canceled. But you know what I'm talking about. Any road. So Hugh Mercer says, no, I don't want quarter. I want to stab you with, with my sword. With my sword. If I'm going to die, I'm not going to die bleeding out in some British, you know, hospital or British tent. Right. I'm going to bleed out while I take a couple of you with me to the other side of the veil. That's right. I just... And we'll continue this over there. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm telling you, like, when I read that, it was just... I mean, uh, yeah. Talk about the icing on the cake. That ratchets yeah. the manly up. It's it's kind of, yeah, it makes you, I felt a, a distinct decrease in my testosterone. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of, I, oh. yeah, I felt like, I don't know, that that makes you feel unmanly. It really does. Because if I'm, put me up against a broad oak. <laughs> You better take me to a hospital, man, and you better be the closest one. And if I ble if I come anywhere close, I'm blaming you. And when I get out, you know, of the hospital, I'm taking the next year off to recuperate. Exactly. It took him nine days nine to days. bleed out, dude. You know what it was? It was all the whiskey. It probably was. He like from the Red Dawn. <laughs> Whiskey, no. <laughs> Risky sow? Is he wanting? Is he wanting to eat? <laughs> Whiskey, no. But oh. I mean, all of that, and being a doctor, and being like, yeah, it's not this, it's the this, and I was like, I got you, I'm a doctor. <laughs> really, Are you sure, Good, Mr. Ben? Uh, can I see your? Can I see your diploma? <laughs> there marcus welby because i'm starting to doubt i'm telling you it's ahead i mean the whole thing is okay all i want to say i want to go on record that if when the big igloo comes down if i get stabbed please please prop me up against a broad oak <laughs> i'm with you please broad oak no <laughs> prop me up against a broad oak <laughs> No, I'm doing a Scottish. By the way, I got it. You, I got my Scottish. Got your Scottish on. I, I, I got it. It impressed. came to me, man. It came to me. And, and General Mercer is here. He is. He's in the building. Tell my story. I want to hear it again. I want to hear my story again. Oh, <laughs> uh, but hey, listen. I I I fell in love with this guy. So much so that I'm okay. writing a musical about him. That's the big news, right there. That is. <laughs> One day you're going to see a musical named. Mercer instead of Hamilton. That's right. Well, and it won't be called Mercer. It will you know be, what I mean? Yeah, it, 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 it'll be better than Hamilton. I'm going to tell you that right now. Stay tuned. Yeah, because Hugh Mercer's worthy of a his story being told. Alexander Hamilton got what he deserved, right? I, and I will say, like, even coming on this podcast, talking about him, 
kind of makes me nervous just because like I want to do justice by oh, him. Man. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know what I mean? I mean, I think he's the kind of guy that's like, I appreciate you, Mike, but you know, if his story doesn't get told, he's fine. But I think the re- it doesn't say anything about him. Right. It says something about us if we don't tell his story. Absolutely. And I mean, we we tried to do that tonight. We did tell the story, but also. I mean, you're musical. I mean, I've seen little snippets of the, some of the songs. Oh my gosh, dude! Some of these songs, you, I'm not even kidding. Literally, crying when you, yeah, the dude. I appreciate that, man. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm telling you guys, like, you got. There are more humorists out there. I believe. I mean, I don't think there's just one humorist. Honestly, like, I don't think there's anybody like. You know what, what's uh, what's the uh, Park and Rec guy, the Ron Swanson, Swanson. Swanson yeah. pyramid of like, manliness. Yeah, yeah. humorister is at the top. Okay. Uh, I mean, I mean Jesus. Okay, well, no, I'm just you saying. Got me, you got me there. You I'm not. Me. I mean, even at the pyramid of war for independence greatness i mean he's up he's he's definitely in the pantheon i'm gonna give you that definitely deserves a place in the pantheon of american revolutionary heroes and i and i love the aspect of if you think about his life um from culloden where he lived survived but the cause was lost and then he ends up in Princeton having sacrificed all for a cause that we are now still celebrating and hopefully reviving here on the, uh, on the old pod here. But like that symmetry to me, like it, it hit me like as one of those spiritual moments of like, he was meant to be at that place at that time for this reason. And and I recognize that, and I appreciate you, brother. No, I, I think that you did a great. I mean, honestly, with no you know no hint of humor, the the service you did to to his memory is 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 noble and marked by me at least, and I'm sure other people too that see this. They'll be. I mean, it's got to feel good, man, that you know that someone's going to watch this, and whatever day you know, whatever day people watch it. Someone will be talking about Hugh Mercer that before seeing your hearing your story tonight didn't know who he was. Dude, that that's big that's time. a big yeah. deal because that person who hears it might be the mother or father of a young man who they decide to tell that young man that story, and he's and we don't know that he's not the next Hugh Mercer, and but for you telling the story, it would have gone untold. Thank you, brother. Guys, you're listening to the greatest podcast ever where we talk about, yes, greatness. <laughs> All right. Keep, keep some powder dry. Till next time, y'all.